Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, being here. I have spoken at several Toastmasters groups over the past several months talking about anxiety management, something that's near and dear to my heart. And it's a different topic than what we're covering today, but, but one that I think underlies most of, of why many people get involved with Toastmasters, at least to begin with. And if I can be of any service to any of your organizations coming to speak, I'm very happy to do that. I, I was recently, literally just two days ago, at each one of the HP Toastmasters group, had a great time. I enjoy doing that. So there's contact information on something I'll be giving you. I'm happy to uh, join us, happy to share uh, what little <laughs> I, I know. But uh, I, I, I do enjoy this, and I, and I hope you get something out of it. This, uh, today, we are going to talk about one of what I think is the most challenging communication things we do, and that is to facilitate, which is deeper and more intense, I think, than, than simple presentation or communication. So I will give us a definition of facilitation in just a few moments, but let me set your expectations for what it is we'll be doing today. We're going to start by defining what we mean by facilitation. We're then going to explore facilitation in two of the many contexts that facilitation exists in, and then we're actually going to practice it. So we're going to be doing work today. I want this to be a highly interactive session, so I'd like for you to participate as well. So we've got some ground rules. Uh, please ask any questions that come to mind that are related to the topics we cover. Please work together when we do our work time to collaborate to help all of us become better at facilitating. And I really hope we have some fun along the way. So what I'd like to do first is give you a handout. Um, I know it's a little dangerous. If you wouldn't mind helping, thank you. Giving a handout. Let's keep this uh, just because people like to read. You can tell I'm also pitching my company, and I'll spend a few moments probably at the end telling you a little bit about that, but uh, the logo's everywhere. I'd like you to keep this handout with the, this small piece of paper that's in the upper left-hand corner. Keep that up on top, and we're going to use that piece of paper in just a moment. There you go. Okay, if everybody would take the little sheet of paper off, I'd like you to flip it over. Without writing on this sentence, I want you just to look at it in our very first activity of the day. Please do me a favor, count the number of F's in that sentence without drawing, writing, or underlining in any way, shape, or form. Have a seat, please. I'll give you about 10 more seconds to do this. It's a really quick activity. All right, let's flip that piece of paper upside down. Let's look up here so we're not tempted to look at it anymore. Raise your hand if you found three and only three F's, please. Raise your hand if you found four and only four F's. Five and only five F's? Six and only six F's. There are six F's. Can you turn that over again, please? What two-letter word ending in F oh, did many of us right. miss? Oh. 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 Yeah, we, we well. skipped oh. that. <laughs> Why does Matt start every workshop, every class I teach with this activity? Well, about 15 years ago, somebody did this to me, and I only found three, and I felt really stupid. So I like to pass that. No, no. <laughs> I do this activity because this activity is exactly what we'll be talking about today. It is about finding little things that make a big difference between being effective and ineffective, between getting it right or closer to right than getting it wrong. Okay? The little things that make a big difference in facilitation are very subtle. They're very subtle. And yet people who master the art of facilitation do these things. And most of us, when we're being facilitated well, in a meeting, for example, we don't even notice what's happening. So this activity is a good example of what it is we will be talking about today. It's going to make us focus on the little things that make a big difference. And it doesn't hurt that we look for Fs, and facilitation starts with the letter F as well. So what I'd like to do is get us started looking at what facilitation is, and then we'll get into some specific context in which facilitation occurs, and we'll do some activities around it. And then finally, we'll conclude with you guys having an opportunity to facilitate little interactions in small groups in here, OK? So we hope the technology comes back on. There we go. So what do we mean by facilitation? Facilitation, the word facil is a uh, Latin derivative in Spanish. Does anybody know what facil in Spanish means? Easy. easy. Excellent. And that's what facilitation essentially means. It's to make things easy. Facilitation is a critical communication skill. 
it is absolutely essential to being effective in many aspects of what we do when we present. When we present, give a speech, we are in monologue mode. I am speaking, you are listening. Now you are all giving me feedback through your nonverbal communication, so yes, I am paying attention to that. But when we go into facilitation mode, that's dialogue. That's when we're actually interacting, when we're conversing together, and that's when facilitation kicks in. And the challenge of facilitation is not only do I have to worry about what it is I'm saying and how I'm saying it, but I gotta worry about what you're saying and how you're saying it and how that affects me and everybody else around. So I've just quadrupled at least the amount of effort and concentration I have to have when I am in facilitation. To make it easy, I've distilled what I call the three E's of facilitation. We need to be aware of the environment. We have to be experts at expectation management. And at the bottom line, we are really all about empowering ourselves and the people we are facilitating to get the job done, whatever that job is. So I'd like to spend a few moments just chatting a little bit about each of these at a high level. And then what we're going to do is get in and explore each of these in a particular context. And I've selected these contexts because they highlight some of these issues. When I talk about the environment, I'm talking about the communication environment. Where are you communicating? What is the room like? Are there chairs? Are there tables? How many people are present? How close are the restrooms? These are all things you need to take into account when you are managing or facilitating the communication event. So the environment has to do with the context where you speak. And it's not just physical, the physical situation. It also has to do with time. How much time do you have? How much time do people expect to take place for each speaking event? You have to manage the time as well. So the environment is the first of our three E's. Good facilitators are experts at setting expectations and managing those expectations. We start with agendas, we start with previews, we set ground rules. All of this is so people know what's coming and what to expect. Human beings do not like uncertainty. When we are in situations of being uncertain, we don't feel comfortable. One of the tenets in communication theory, as a matter of fact, one of the, the most cited communication theories is called uncertainty reduction theory. And uncertainty reduction theory is all about how can we reduce the amount of uncertainty we have in our communication acts. Because human beings like predictability, we don't like uncertainty, setting expectations and managing to them helps. And that's why everybody always tells you to preview what you're going to say, because you help people understand what's coming next. And then finally, the empowerment piece, the third of our three E's, is about allowing people in your environment to have a level of comfort so that they feel comfortable and supported in their communication. You as the speaker or facilitator also should feel comfortable and empowered managing that environment. So what we will do in the next little bit is cover our three E's in very specific context, and I'm going to ask you to participate along the way. Any questions so far? So let me, let me give you an analogy to help understand what a good facilitator does. I think the best analogy I can think of a facilitator is an orchestra conductor. The orchestra conductor makes no noise. The orchestra conductor, however, helps facilitate some of the most beautiful music you'll ever hear. Okay. A good facilitator is somebody who does work in a way that is very subtle, that does not appear to be controlling, yet makes a big difference over the success of the communication that happens. There's a wonderful quote that refers to leadership, but I think also translates nicely into what I mean when I talk about facilitation. And this comes from the great Taoist philosopher Lao Tzu. The wicked leader is he whom the people despise, the good leader is he whom the people revere. The great leader is he of whom the people say, we did it ourselves. And that's the goal of facilitation. I apologize for the sexism in the quote. He is not mine. Okay. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And when we're done today, I hope you have not only a theoretical understanding of facilitation, but actually an experiential one. You will all be facilitating some questions in a little bit. There are many contexts in which facilitation occurs. We are picking two today. The first is running meetings. And the reason I selected the 
running of meetings is it really allows you to dive deep and understand the issues involved in setting up the communication environment. That was the first E we discussed. And then the second, the second context we'll look at is question and answers. That is the answering of Q&A at the end of a presentation, in a job interview, in a meeting. Whenever you are in the position to actually manage the question and answers, that is facilitation. And we're going to talk about some guidance and advice for managing facilitation in Q&A session. And that really lets us explore the last two E's that we talked about, expectation management, although we'll do some of that with meetings, as well as empowerment. So I picked these two contexts because they call to the front the three E's I introduced you to at the beginning. So that's where we're headed. Let's start with meetings. Good facilitation is all about the work you do prior to the actual event. It's not just what happens in the room during the event, although that's important, but it's the pre-work you do in advance. And there are several areas that we have to look at when it, we go into exploring the communication environment prior to a meeting. In your handouts, the first handout that was underneath that clip is something that says Facilitation Pre-Work Worksheet. I invite all of you to look at that. This information um, is summarized up here, but you'll see it detailed in, in a more questioning format where you could actually write some information. Oh, a couple of you came in late. Would you like some handouts? Could I ask somebody to just, could you pass those behind you? I think there are two that are needed. Five, five that are needed. Ah. Okay. And you know what? I have three more. Six that are needed. You know, Jim, can I just give this to you? As people come in, will you hand them out? Thank you so much. So these worksheets are worksheets that, as part of my consulting practice, we actually give to clients. So you have these in front of you, and they are designed to be interactive, where you'd actually write down information. Unless in the current moment you are planning a meeting, you don't need to write any information here. But this is a form you could use to help you prepare. I'd like to walk through just a few of these items. I might not get to every bullet point, but I do want to highlight them. Thank you so much for your help. So the first step in facilitating a meeting, planning for the environment, is to first understand who's going to be in the environment. Okay. I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever attended a meeting that you thought was poorly run, um, didn't have any clear goals, the, the outcome was, I, I see people raising hands, feet, toes, everything, right? okay? This process of facilitation will minimize that. And again, it goes back to those Fs we looked at at the beginning. It's subtle little things that make a big difference, like thinking about in advance who's going to be in the room. So let me ask, show you some questions you can ask that will help you define a meeting that should be more effective uh, if you go through these facilitation steps. The first question is who's attending, and more importantly, why? Why are they there? I have been invited to several meetings where I didn't need to be there. Okay? And similarly, I've been in meetings where I was supposed to be there, it was very important that I was there, but other people that were also important to the meeting should have been there that weren't. So the first question is, who's there and why? And as a facilitator, you need to think about these things because you want to make sure the right people are there. The next question is, is the meeting co-located, that means everybody's sitting next to each other, or is it mediated, meaning there's some technology between you and the other people? How many of you have ever done a WebEx presentation? Several of you. How many have ever participated in a conference call? Most of you. Those are presentations or meetings where people are remote. They're mediated. There's a technology between you and them. And when you run a meeting or give a presentation in that modality, there are some things you can do to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of those meetings. I don't know how much time we'll have to go into those, but I'm happy to take some questions. And, and by the way, reminder of our ground rules. If you ever have a question, let me know. I'm happy to, to stop and, and answer those questions. You also need to think about power and status issues. I used to run an organization, and whenever I participated in a meeting, the meetings went very differently, at least I'm told, than when I wasn't in those meetings. The, sta the status and power that I had affected the influence of the meeting. My hunch is the meetings that you attend are also influenced by who's present in the meetings. So you need to think about that. I'm now paid professionally sometimes to go in and facilitate meetings for organizations sometimes I know nothing about. I just come in and help lead their meetings, facilitate their meetings. And one of the first things I do before I go in is figure out the status. And I often will ask the high st highest status person in the room to go do a very important task. Go get us water, go make sure lunch is going to arrive. I get the person out of the room as quickly as I can to get the meeting started, to get people feeling comfortable. 
Okay, so knowing the status is very important in power of the movement. And are there historical concerns? Most of you participate in meetings that occur frequently, weekly, monthly, etc. Those meetings have a history to them. What's worked in the past? What hasn't worked? That information can help you as a facilitator make your meeting more successful. One of the first things I asked when I was invited here to speak was, what's worked in the past? What makes these meetings that you are now participating in successful? And I was given some feedback. And I hope at the end of our time together, you'll see that I've employed some of that. So asking these questions can be very important. Next, we need to think about what, yes, sir, please. Corporate culture. Yes. If you have a culture that is imbued with ineffective meetings. Yes. And you want to be uh -huh. following something like this. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? How do you fight it? Okay. You, I believe leading by example. Uh, the last high-tech company I worked in before I did my transition into uh, education, uh, the, the norm was, well, first, very ineffective meetings. You came into the meeting, everybody showed up five minutes late, nobody showed up on time. First thing they did is sat down, propped up their laptop, and they said, okay, I'm ready for the meeting to start. What's that mean? You're ready to check your email in the presence of other people is what you're saying. Okay? So I just, in my meetings, no laptops. I started, if anybody was in the room or not. Okay? So you begin changing the culture by demonstrating. I'll tell you this, and I saw this in my own life. People I've worked with and coached tell me the same thing. If you run effective meetings, people will actually be happy to be there. They'll do their work. They see the value of it. We all, we're not anti-meeting. We're anti-ineffective meeting. So if you begin to run effective meetings, this is going to sound crazy to some of you in the room, and, I, and I, I am by no means trying to brag, but I have had people at the end of meetings say, thank you for that meeting. Can you imagine many of the meetings you've gone to ever stopping and saying thank you to the people who ran those meetings? Not often. If we, if we begin to practice some of these skills, you can see some of that change. Okay? And, it, and sometimes it's not hard. You have to do a couple of these, but then people begin to see the effectiveness. There is value in meetings, but they have to be effective meetings. And the effectiveness comes through effective facilitation. Very quickly, we need to understand the meeting's purpose. Are we actually making decisions? Are we just discussing? Are we advising? We have to think about what the desired outcomes are. A really powerful question for any facilitator to ask in any situation, but particularly in meetings, is how will I know if I've been successful? How will I know if this meeting has been successful? I challenge all of you as presenters, ask yourself this, how will I know if my presentation is successful? For most of us, it's, I survived. <laughs> That's not the right answer. The right answer is more like the audience got what they needed. Okay, so we have to think about what is our success metric. In terms of how every meeting, every communication act, presentation, meeting, I don't care what it is, occurs within a larger organization, a larger structure, how does this meeting help that structure? How does it go? What's been expected? You need to understand your meeting's position in the overall history and structure of the organization. And that includes asking yourself questions like, who needs to know the results of this meeting? Who, get, who needs to get the information once it's done? Any of you ever been in the situation I have often found myself where decisions are made in some other meeting? I'm happily marching along to the old orders, not knowing their new orders, and all of a sudden hit the brick wall. Why are you doing it that way? I didn't know. Nobody ever told me from the previous meeting. So we need to be thinking about not only how does what we do fit into the organizational structure, but who needs to know once a decision has been made outside of that meeting. In terms of event design, we need to think about the location of the meeting. Okay, some rooms are better than others. What kind of technology do we need? How do we have that all set up, etc.? So we definitely need to make sure that we consider the environment. We need to think of amenities. If you've ever run a long meeting, you need to know where the bathrooms are, where the closest caffeine is, you know, how many, how many power cords you have, if you need technology. These are things you need to think about, and a good facilitator has that all prepared. So the audience, the participants, show up and they don't have to worry. Because their experience, even before the meeting starts, reflects on you and sets their expectations for the meeting. If people come in and you as a facilitator look confused and harried and you don't know where everything is, before the meeting has even started, people have expectations. And it's hard to go against initial expectations. Timing is very important. Think about when the meeting is taking place. I had to think long and hard. Sunday afternoon, middle of the afternoon. I was actually pleased, not be I have two young boys, and I was not pleased that the weather wasn't very nice. 
for them, because I would rather be outside playing with them, but for you all, I was very pleased that the weather was bad. Because you might be motivated to come here, okay, instead of being drawn by the beautiful weather to, to be outside. So I think about the timing. I taught high school for two years, and I don't think my principal liked me very much, because she gave me freshmen, 15-year-olds, right before lunch and right after lunch. Okay? Oh freshmen are hard to teach anyway. Okay? But at the school I taught, I taught in Almaden, Leland High School, these kids went to school essentially for four hours straight. They went to four classes back to back, five minute passing period in between each. So they came to me during hour four. If you know anything about 15 year olds, they need, they need sustenance like every 10 minutes. They need food, they need <laughs> water, you know, they didn't get any of that. So they came to me listless, no energy sitting. So what did I do? Knowing the little subtle things that make a big difference, I set up the room as a circle. Nobody could sleep in my classroom. It's very hard to sleep when everybody else is watching you. <laughs> I turned the thermostat down. It was freezing in my classroom. <laughs> as a now you laugh, but this is me thinking about what do I need so these kids can be there to, to pay attention and to stay awake and be involved. Now, I had a similar group of freshmen right after lunch. They've just seen all their friends. They've had all their caffeine. They've had all their sugar. They're bouncing off the walls. What did I do? Straight rows, thermostat turned the other way. It's really warm in the room. It's hard to be that energetic. My point is not to show you that I'm a manipulative bastard, <laughs> but my point is that as a facilitator, as an educator in that instance, I needed to do things to make sure that my participants, my audience, would be available to learn what I was trying to teach them. Okay, so each of you needs to think about the timing. Many of you work for companies where you're participating in meetings where it's 10 a.m. here, very convenient for you. You've had your two cups of coffee, checked your email, but you're talking to colleagues in Europe. You're, you might even be later in the day talking to your colleagues in Asia Pacific. You need to think about their mindset, their status, okay? because as a facilitator, that's very important to, to the success. Okay? I apologize. We reset there. Uh, you then need to think about your uh, decision-making process. If it is a decision-making meeting, how are you actually going to make the decision? And you need to set your audience's expectations. We're going to make our decision today by consensus. And I let that be known right away up front because that's going to frame the way we're going to have our discussion versus majority vote or however else you make decisions when you meet. Again, it's about expectation management. It's about understanding the Questions on the things we do before we ever have our meeting. This is all pre-work. This is things, these are things I go through, good facilitators go through, to make sure that the meeting is likely to be successful. No? Yes, sir. More, uh, you know, I do very meticulous meeting preparation. Great. And then you get to the meeting and you know that you have to adapt. So I always have the sense that having set the structure, here I am, say it's an eight-hour meeting. Yes. Halfway through saying, we're not going to follow the agenda, we're going to adapt it. So there's a need to reset right. expectations, maybe a bit course correction. How do you do that? Okay, so uh, a great question asked. I mean, for the, ver so <laughs> the first thing that caused my, my heart to pound is an eight-hour meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, there is, there's a lot of good research that says shorter meetings, shorter duration is actually more effective. So if you can chunk an eight-hour meeting in that any was, way, please uh, do. That was handed it to me on a right. Friday afternoon and say, would you facilitate an eight-hour meeting on Monday? And I said, what? <laughs> exactly. As I, I would have said, what the, I followed it with an expletive. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> So you're, you're a better, better human being than I. Uh, the, 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 question, the, the question brings up a really key point. Facilitators are flexible. A lot of the concepts we're talking about today start with the letter F. We're flexible. So as things evolve and change, we need to make adjustments. Now, facilitators don't unilaterally make those decisions. We pose questions and decisions and allow the participants to help choose. So a number of times I have been confronted with a, a timeline where the meeting is set to end, and we need to end the meeting, but we're really into the meat of a particular topic, or people have more to say. So I'll say, let's just take a, a, a time check here. We have a few minutes left, but we're, on, we're involved in a really interesting point. Should we as a group decide to continue? How should we handle this? So, so I'm always taking the pulse of the audience. I'm reading the participants choices. So yes, you have to be flexible, engage in dialogue, and get feedback from others. Absolutely. Okay. Yes? I guess you can answer this question a little sure. bit, but shouldn't pre-work also include plan B? 
Absolutely. Contingency planning is very important, and in, in the book I wrote on anxiety management, I spend a, a good chunk of time of contingency planning. A lot of us are nervous because we're, we're afraid of all the what-ifs, so if we spend time thinking about the what-ifs and then coming up with plans for them, then it can be very helpful. Absolutely. And the, just like anything, the more you do this, the more comfortable and flexible you become. Absolutely. So yes, you should, have, you should think about what happens if. What if I show up for the two-hour meeting and I'm told I only have an hour? How do I adjust that? I shouldn't be thinking about that in the moment. I've already thought about what happens if my time's reduced. Absolutely. If you flip the page, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of ground rules. Ground rules set the parameters for appropriate behavior. You'll notice I started this talk by giving you some ground rules. There are three primary types of ground rules, the behavioral, procedural, and content ground rules. Behavioral ground rules tell you what it is you expect the participants to do. Okay. Then you have procedural ground rules, which tell you how the participants should do it. Robert's rules of order, many of you know those, I move, I second, etc. That's a that is a procedural ground rule. Some organizations have procedural ground rules where if you agree with somebody, rather than saying I agree, you all snap. Or some rule, some rules, behavior, or um, procedural rules, the person who speaks is the person who's holding the microphone, who has the speaking stay. I, they vary. But they're rules for who gets to speak and who doesn't. And then content ground rules have to do with what is said. Okay, so perhaps you have a ground rule that says everything has to be related to the topic we're discussing. No tangents. Perhaps you say you have to summarize what the person said before you speak. A wide variety of rules. But whatever they are, you set the ground rules up front. You might co-create them with the participants. You might, as a facilitator, bring them to the group. But they help you work smoothly and get through your material in an effective way. What I'd like to do very quickly is I'd like to ask you all to come up with some ground rules that might work. And I think the, the easiest way to do this is find somebody sitting next to you. If you don't know who they are, introduce yourself. And what I'd like you to do is spend, we're going to do this for three minutes, spend a minute on each of the ground rules and come up with an example of what a reasonable behavioral ground rule might be that you could use in your work environment or in your personal life, okay? So get with somebody. If you don't know who they are, introduce yourselves. And each of you are trying to come up with one ground rule for each category. Okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, if you got all three, great. If you didn't, that's okay. I'd like for you, please, to um, look up here, focus away from that activity. Notice also, part of facilitation is managing activities when they happen. Okay, so how did I do this? I, I paired you up, I let you pair up, and I stepped away. If people didn't have partners, I worked on that. I gave you a warning. I said one minute left. Please bring your activity to a conclusion. And then when you were done, I directed you to where I needed your attention. Again, these are all facilitation techniques. If they're done appropriately and politely, they're not seen as rude and, and overbearing. And that's important. Is there anybody who would like to share a behavioral ground rule that you came up with? Somebody please? Yes, please. Raising hands. OK, so a behavioral round, a ground rule would be to raise hands when you want to speak. So that, so some of these rules you're going to see are going to be like, do they fit? Where do they fit? So, so that could also be a procedural ground rule, but that's behavioral. That's fine. Yes. One of the problems in the meetings is uh, everybody wants to talk, nobody wants to listen. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, the rule that we came up with is we have a ball. We take a ball. Uh -huh. Whoever has the ball speaks. Okay. Okay. Again, I would say that could also be a procedural, procedural. ground rule, but the, but the idea being. I often attend meetings where nobody wants to speak, <laughs> in which case I'd be throwing the ball at people. But, but you know, right. So, but that I like that idea. Yes, a behavioral rule, please. Turn off your cell phone. Yeah, wonderful rule. Turn off your cell phone. Absolutely. I do uh, volunteer mediations for the county. Oh, Keep great. language respectful. Perfect. Okay. So no, no, that, that's also behavior. No name calling. No. Um, wonderful. So, so the type of language could also be behavior. Could also be content. Because remember, the third type of ground rule is content. Again, these fit in different places, and that's fine. I'm not offended that these are messy. What what coming up with the three causes you to do is think about the distinctions, the three different types. Let's move on to the next type. The next type we have are pr uh, procedural. We had the ball. We had the the uh, listening. So along the lines of the bar, we said, let the previous speaker finish. Because often what happens, you said, no. <laughs> right, absolutely. So everybody has to, to complete their thought before the next person starts. Excellent. A time limit for questions and for answers. Absolutely. So you have two minutes to speak. Okay. A great one for letting the person 
finish is to have somebody summarize what they said, the previous person said before you speak. Because what they'll realize is, oh crap, <laughs> I didn't let the person finish. And so I have to, yes, yes please. Yeah, a quick review at the end of the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. And we, a good facilitator will summarize throughout, especially if it's an eight hour meeting, <laughs> summarize throughout. <laughs> but if it's a shorter meeting, and you'll see hopefully me do that today. Yes, please. Uh, Define breaks. Absolutely. In, in meetings, so people right. don't Procedural. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll break at this point. Or conversely, we're going to get hot and heavy into a discussion. If you need to take care of personal needs, go do it. So you can do the opposite there. Let's have an example of a content ground rule, please. Stay on topic. Stay on topic. Absolutely. No tangents. Great. Okay, so you get the, the flavor. And again, the, the point here, the goal of this is to, prior to running the meeting, come up with these, declare them. And the power of this for you as a facilitator is if one of these rules gets violated, you get to refer back to them. So you're not being the bad person. You're not being the person who's keeping people on track. The rules are there, and I'm simply reminding you of the rules. Okay, so it allows you that, that separation, which can be very helpful. Are there questions about facilitation before I take us on a, on a big transition here? <laughs> okay, so we've talked about the first E, I hope you see, and, and a little bit about the, the, the second E that we, we started with. So we, we started by saying what's really important uh, in facilitation is pre-work, is, is thinking about what's coming ahead, the environment, that was our first E, and then we talked about expectation setting. I want to transition now to the empowerment piece and revisit expectation setting by talking a bit about and my slides aren't going to move on. There we go. Okay, question and answer sessions. Question and answer sessions are a very common activity that happen after you speak, unless you're brave enough to take the questions while you speak. Facilitation is key. You, you are risking a lot when you go from monologue mode to dialogue mode at the end of a presentation. You're risking your credibility. Okay, you've established for however long you've spoken, your, your ideas, your credibility as a speaker, and now all of a sudden you are into the mode of answering questions. How many of you have seen a speaker give a, a, a decent speech or maybe even a really good speech, and then in question and answer mode they sort of shut down and become protective? They step back, that happens all the time. Yeah. Okay? And then you're left wondering, who's the, who is the speaker? Is the speaker the person who gave the speech or the person who's answering the question and answers? So fidelity refers to accuracy and clarity of information, and Q&A sessions are exactly what allows for fidelity. It's a, what allows my message to clearly get to you, because if it's not clear, you ask me questions. So Q&A allows for higher fidelity, but it also is a big risk for your credibility. So it's a big challenge, and many people get very nervous about the Q&A part. There are some people who actually find the Q&A part easier because it's conversational. Again. It doesn't matter, you still have to facilitate it well. So I want to talk a little bit about steps for facilitation and then give you some of the little subtle things that make a big difference. The next sheet of paper you have, find the side that says Q&A process, please. Because of our timing, I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail. I just want to summarize some information and then we're going to have time where you all get to do some Q&A management. In terms of best practices, Again, pre-work is critical. Any facilitation, I don't care if it's meetings, I don't care if it's Q&A, work ahead of time helps. Think about the types of questions you're going to get. How do you do that? Well, you can reflect on your own. You can go ask people who are typical of the people that might be in your audience. I'm going to present on this, I'm going to talk about that. What do you think? Get some of their questions. So do some work in advance. In addition, make sure you have some key ideas or what I call themes that you want to make sure you get across throughout your presentation, but also in the Q&A. The Q&A is an extension of your presentation. Many of us see it as something very different. The themes that you had in the beginning of the presentation should carry through, so you should know those themes. And it's more than knowing the themes. You should have support for those themes. You should have examples. You should have evidence. So when you think about a particular theme, you should then come with some examples of it. In a few moments, we're going to do an activity where I'm going to have you answer and manage or facilitate interviewing, like job interviewing. So prior to an interview, a good interview candidate will think about his or her strengths and weaknesses, why they want the job, what value they can add. Those are your themes. And then you create some examples and evidence of each of those themes. So when the question gets asked, you don't just tell me, you show me by giving me the examples. The same should be true when you 
answer questions in a presentation. So you think about those things. In addition, the way in which you take questions really sets the stage for your success or not. Many people, when they finish their speech, will do something like this. So there's the end of my speech. <sighs> Any questions? <laughs> right? Totally relaxed. They become a different person. And now, because I taught freshmen, I'm very aware of this. You say any questions, you get questions like, why is spaghetti, you know, whatever. You get these questions, because I said, are there any questions? And people ask you, any question. <laughs> a good facilitator sets parameters, sets expectations. So I might say something like, we have 10 minutes, and I'd like to take three or four questions related to the solution I just provided. Think about what that does for me. It gives me the ability to accept and reject questions based on how it is I called for them. Somebody could say, well, I have a question about the uh, problem you asserted. Thank you for bringing that up. Right now, I want to focus on questions related to my solution I suggested. We outside. By setting up those parameters, I define what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Okay? Now, I could choose to answer that question about my problem or the problem I brought up, but that's a choice. I don't have to because I set up the parameters. So set up the parameters up front. Okay, you want to make sure that you, you respectfully set up the boundaries. When someone asks you a question, use good paraphrasing skills. That is, repeat the question back in your own words. This does three wonderful things for you. The first thing it does is it makes sure you're about to answer the right question. Okay, I've had that experience where I've answered a question that nobody asked. I thought I had, but I didn't get it right. Okay? So it allows me to get the right question. Second thing it allows me to do is it allows the person who asked the question to feel valued. The person was brave enough to raise their hand. We ask so few questions in our society. I'm a teacher. I have 30 to 50 students in class every time. I'll be darned if I get one or two questions each class. People are too afraid to ask questions. Just like they're afraid to get up and speak, they're afraid to ask a question. And it's even worse asking a question because what do, what, why don't people ask questions? What are they afraid their neighbors are going to think of them? Um, they're stupid. They weren't paying attention, right? Absolutely. So people don't ask questions. So when they do, you reward them by paraphrasing it. I heard you. And the third thing, this is your advantage. We have the ability to parrot back what people say and think at the same time. So it gives me a little buffer so I can begin to prepare my answers. So paraphrasing is very important, and you want to make sure that you listen uh, to the questions well. Okay? When you answer the questions, I am a big fan of making sure you make a claim, you make a statement, you give an example, a description, a definition, and then you explain the benefits of that information. And that, that's written down on your sheets. I'll show you where in a second. Don't, don't go looking for it. So when you ask me a question, and you'll notice, when you all ask me questions, I do, I do this. I answer the question. That's my statement. I then give an example or pull from your example, and then I try to summarize or give a benefit for it. Okay, that's very useful for you and for your audience. I'm going to talk in a minute about what you do for challenging questions, because there are challenging questions. When you're done with your question and answer session, you want to make sure that you end it gracefully. You don't just stop. OK, we're done. OK, that's not appropriate. Or even, you might even be polite, say thank you, and then get off the stage. No, when you answer the questions, you should go back to the central tenant of your presentation, of your meeting, come to it and say, thank you for the, those questions. I clearly see that you value what we're talking about, and I want to remind you that. And then you remind them of what you said, and you might even add a call to action. So now we can all go out and do this. End with a summary of what you had said prior. We as human beings remember the first things we hear and the last things we hear. The stuff in the middle sort of gets blurry. So remind them at the end. The last thing your audience should not hear from you is, Whew, thank you. <laughs> it should be your central thesis, OK? <laughs> what do we do when the questions get hard? And here I've just listed a few. To run down just a couple tips and tricks, because I want to have time for you to, to practice this. First, what happens when people ask what I call machine gun questions? Multiple questions at once, three or four questions. Why? Not because they're mean, just because they've got lots on their mind and you've just shared a lot with them. Best thing you can do, you might see this as a little mean. Wow, that's a lot of questions. Would you mind repeating them for me? <laughs> Most often they can't. Okay. And if they can, or they can't, they'll, they'll, pe they'll prioritize them. So if they ask you five questions, they might come back and give you three. Okay, but the three they give you are the ones they really want the answers because those are the ones they remember. So first thing is ask for clarification, get them, and then 
go ahead and answer the questions. Now, if somebody asks me five questions, I might say, you just asked a lot of questions. I want to make sure everybody else has an opportunity. Let me answer two, and then I'll come back if there's time. And of course, you always make sure you come back. If you make a promise, you always return. Okay, so machine gun questions, ask first, pick a few, then you can come back. Comments instead of questions. Sometimes people just don't know what the question is, especially if you're sharing something with them that they don't understand. So you might get a lot of comment and no question. What do you do as a facility? As a question answerer, take the time to help them find a question. So what I think you're asking is about this. Often they're just so relieved because they got themselves in this quagmire and they don't know where they are. You help focus it. Okay? You help focus it. Okay? So, so find the, the question. Now, sometimes people in the audience like to talk just to talk, right? Or they're trying to prove a point. Okay, the nice thing is everybody has to breathe. And when they take an inhalation, you step in. That's if you're being polite. A lot of facilitation has to do with nonverbals. So if I have somebody who's, at, who's stating a lot, not asking a lot of questions, maybe they're, they're being a little difficult, what I will do with my body is I will move away slowly. And you've seen me do this today with certain questions. If somebody asks, I approach, then I, then I move away when I get it, and I return to the rest of the audience. Most people get that clue, oh, he's done with me. <laughs> we don't get it consciously, we get it unconsciously. So we, we, we let that happen. Okay, so I, I just communicated a lot without saying the word. Okay, so use your nonverbal space in the room well. That's why I hate these things. If you stand behind a lectern the whole time, you've just eliminated a good half of your ability to manage and facilitate. Okay, so come out from behind those things. That, that and laser pointers, I think, are the worst uh, thing that happened to public speaking. Yes. Sitting around the table, what's yes. the equivalent? You're facilitating, you're sitting the way you the table, The way you orient saying? your body. Okay. The way you orient your body. So you can turn and swivel. Okay. Eye contact, very important. Okay. Okay, we're moving. Um, hostile, irrelevant, or loaded questions. First bit of advice, never acknowledge the, the emotion, just that the person is emotional. So if somebody says something that exhibits a lot of anger, don't say, you're angry, because they might say, no, I'm not, I'm frustrated. Now we're arguing over their emotional state. <laughs> what I would say is, you seem very passionate about this topic. Okay? I acknowledge that there is emotion there, but I'm not labeling it, and then I get to the underlying issue. Don't leave the emotion out there as this big pink elephant in the room. Acknowledge it. You're, you're upset. So I, I would say, you're passionate about this issue. And it's something that I can understand, that concern. Here's my thought, and then I answer that. So acknowledge the emotion. Don't name it, because okay? you can get into big trouble. If you don't know the answer to a question, say, I don't know, but follow up. I'll get you that answer. I'm going to follow up by email by the end of the week. Make sure you come back to it. Sometimes you'll ask for questions. This is a difficult situation, and there are none. What do you do? <laughs> are there any questions? Most of us would do this. Are there any questions? No? Okay, good. We're done. <laughs> I didn't give you any time to even raise your hand. If there are no questions, ask yourself a question. Prime the pump. You can say something like, often I'm asked, and then ask yourself a question. My only advice is, Ask yourself a question you know the answer to. <laughs> That's the Q&A part. We don't have much time, and I apologize. I always talk more than I should. Flip that page over. I've given you a little extra here than, than what we need for this activity. This is job interviewing. And a job interview, at least the way I foresee this activity, can be very helpful uh, to practicing facilitation. The first 16 questions there are sample interview questions that came from the Kellogg School of Business. They did a survey, I think, in 2006, and they, they solicited input from the Fortune 500 companies about what questions do you ask during interviews. They synthesized it down to 66 of the most commonly asked interview questions from the Fortune 500. From that, I picked these 16. Okay, so that list, these are meaningful questions. If you read, scan them, many of you have had these questions. In terms of interviewing answering tips, I give you some advice here. This is not a talk on interviewing skills. Go ahead and look at those at some point. They'll be helpful. The structure to the interview questions is, is where I told you I would have written down for you that notion of give a claim, explain in detail, give details, descriptions, definitions, and then tell the benefits. So that you see in front of you. What I envision us doing, and, and I'm going to have to defer to the powers that be. I am like one minute shy of the time I was given to speak. Do you want me to end it or do you want me to do three minutes of the activity? I don't, I don't know who to look at. So I don't know who the power is. 
<laughs> you look at the timer. It's I look at the timer. Yeah, so the timer, you got 250. You're, you're fine. Okay. I'm do do we want you a, a red at 255? At 255. Great. Good. The timer answered my question. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You all get to be facilitators. Thank you, Mr. Timer. Um, what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to get with two other people now. So now we're going to be in, in subsets of three. And what you're going to do is each of you is going to practice taking a question. So what you're going to do is you're going to pretend that you just, somebody said, why are you qualified for this job? And you just told them, right? And now you want them to ask you some questions. So this isn't really a job interview, but it's sort of like a job interview. So I want you to say something like, I'd like to take one or two questions about my qualifications for the job. So remember the first part of Q&A, the first facilitation part, is how you call for questions. I want you to practice calling for questions, asking for them. Don't just say, do you have any questions? Say, do you have one or two questions that I can answer about my qualifications for the job? Do you see how I put parameters around the questions? And then the two people you're working with, they're going to have questions for you. You know what those questions are? It's 1 through 16 on that sheet. Okay, They're going to ask one, one of those questions. Okay, and what you're going to do is you're then going to practice answering the question in the way we discuss. Okay, so you're going to practice answering the question by giving an, a, by giving an answer, giving a, a definition, description, or example, and then you're going to say a benefit. This is part of your preparation. Now, if you were taking a class of mine where we would talk about facilitation, we would spend a whole day doing this, it would be a four to six hour class you would actually get difficult questions and challenging questions and multiple questions. So you would get an opportunity to practice many of those things we just discussed. But for now, I want you to practice asking for a question, answering a question, and then wrapping it up. So you'd wrap it up not just by saying, thank you for your question. You'd wrap it up by saying, thank you for your question. Now I hope you can see why I am the best qualified candidate for this job. You always end with the thing you want the audience to remember. Okay, so we're gonna have to do this kind of quickly. Can you get in groups of three? Each of you will ask for questions, get a question, and then answer it and wrap up. Okay? And you can move these chairs around. These chairs are not glued here. So if you want to move around, let's do it. Okay? Thank you. So I apologize deeply for, for not doing what I said. It is my hope that through our brief time together today, one, you now see that facilitation is a very important communication act. And it is what I see as a next step, a graduation from being able to give really good presentations to being able to do really good facilitations. Just because you're a good presenter doesn't mean you're a good facilitator. And it also works the other way around. There are some people who can facilitate well who can't present to save their lives. Okay, the, the true champion is the one who can do both. I gave you the three E's. It's all about environment, it's all about expectation setting, and it's all about empowerment. Empowering your audience to speak and you to speak as well. I hope there was some value in what we covered both in setting up the meetings as well as for question and answers. I don't want our dialogue to end here. On the bottom of both sheets of paper I gave you, you'll see my email address. You have every right to write to me and ask me questions. There will be no charge. Uh, I am, unfortunately, I worked in high tech for 10 years, so I am very addicted to my email. You will get a response very quickly from me. <laughs> I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you. If I or the company, the consulting company I, I run, can be of service to you or your organizations, by all means, let me know. Some of you came in late. I am honored to speak at Toastmasters groups. I don't charge for that. I come and I talk mostly about anxiety management. I wrote a book called Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. It's a little pocket book. It's only 70 pages. Hopefully it will be helpful to some people. If I can be of help, do, do use me. Okay? And with that, I would simply say thank you for your time, and I hope to stick around and see you guys do some presenting. Thank you.